Hello, welcome to the Ascent of Mount Carmel YouTube channel. If you've just stumbled on this channel and you're watching one of these videos for the very first time, it might make sense for you to go back and watch the videos in numerical order. Today we're discussing the twelfth chapter of the first book of Ascent of Mount Carmel by St. John of the Cross. This chapter explains what the desires are that cause evil to our souls. We've used terms injury, evils, and damage interchangeably, so for the sake of simplicity, we're going to refer to them as evils in this installment. In the prior chapter, we discussed how the voluntary desires cause injury to our souls. In the twelfth chapter, St. John of the Cross makes a distinction between privative evils and positive evils. With respect to the privative evil, which consists of the soul being deprived of God, this is wrought wholly and can only be wrought by the voluntary desires, which are of the matter of mortal sin. For they deprive the soul of grace in this life, and of glory, which is the possession of God in the next life. St. John calls the rest of the evils positive evils. He does not call them positive because there's anything good about them, but because they move us towards something. In this case, they cause us to move toward creatures. As you may recall from the earlier installments, St. John provided us with a list of five evils, concentrating on a chapter for each of the evils. The five positive evils caused by desires do the following. They deprive our souls of the Spirit of God. They weary our souls. They torment our souls. They blind our souls. They defile our souls. And they weaken our souls. St. John says that it may be asked if any desire, however slight it may be, and whatever kind, suffices to produce all of these evils together, or some desires produce some, and others produce others. If, for example, some produce torment, others weariness, and others darkness. St. John answers that all desires, ranging from serious mortal sins to just mere imperfections, cause some evil to our souls. He says, I say that both those desires, which are of the matter of mortal sin, and the voluntary desires, which are of the matter of venial sin, and those which are of the matter of imperfection, are each sufficient to produce in the soul all these positive evils together. Desires involving venial sin or imperfections, however, don't produce all these evils in a complete and total extent, since they don't deprive the soul of grace. It's the loss of grace that causes people to go into a tailspin. As St. John of the Cross says of these desires involving mortal sin, the death of the soul is their life. It is the desires that involve mortal sin that some people would call disordered desires. However, St. John makes it very clear that desires involving venial sins and also just imperfections must also be cast aside. St. John writes, The desires that most weaken grace will produce the most abundant torment, blindness, and defilement. Although each desire produces all these evils, there are some which, principally and directly, produce some of them, and others which produce others, and the remainder are produced consequently upon these. For example, desires of the flesh principally cause defilement. They also cause all the other positive injuries as a consequence of the defilement. St. John says, Although it is true that one sensual desire produces all these evils, yet its principal and proper effect is the defilement of the soul and body. And although one avaricious desire produces them all, its principal and direct result is to produce misery. And although similarly one vainglorious desire produces them all, its principal and direct result is to produce darkness and blindness. And although one gluttonous desire produces them all, its principal result is to produce lukewarmness and virtue. And so it is with the rest. St. John writes, All the virtues grow through the practice of any one of them, and all the vices grow through the practice of any one of them. Likewise, the remnants of each grow in the soul. These good remnants help us to fight off temptations and desire. St. John says, As an act of virtue produces and begets in the soul sweetness, peace, consolation, light, cleanness, and fortitude altogether, even so an unruly desire causes torment, fatigue, weariness, blindness, and weakness. Although these evils are not evident at the moment the desire is indulged, the evil remnants which they leave are clearly perceived, whether before or afterward. To clarify, this discussion has not been about the natural involuntary desires, such as the desire for warmth when we are cold. It is the voluntary desires that work all the evils that we've discussed. We earlier discussed the Desert Fathers. 
When students came to them, the first thing that the fathers did was to instruct their students to mortify all their desires for worldly things. Students did this by remaining in their cells in the desert without the objects of their desires. And this, of course, would sound very extreme and severe to moderns. Yet by placing themselves in isolation, students were free from great misery. Here again, contemplative religious do have an advantage over us because they can do this more easily than we can, since it's more difficult for a layperson to mortify their desires when those desires pretty much remain all around us. But we are given even greater graces when we succeed against these odds. St. John cites 2 Corinthians, Power is made perfect in infirmity. Gladly, therefore, I will glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Bishop Schalliner explains this verse, The strength and the power of God more perfectly shines forth in our weakness and infirmity. And the more weak we are of ourselves, the more illustrious his grace is in supporting us and giving us the victory under all trials and conflicts. Finally, St. John tells us, The principal care of spiritual directors is to mortify their disciples immediately with respect to any desire whatsoever by causing them to remain without the objects of their desires. If you have a spiritual director and he's never discussed this with you, perhaps you don't have the right spiritual director. Remember, no spiritual director is better than a poor one. Well, I hope you enjoyed this installment. We'll be back again in about a week with another one. But in the meantime, please check out my Facebook page, which is linked down below. Also, check out the Ascent of Mount Carmel group, which is a Facebook group devoted to the study of mystical theology. That's also linked down below. And please, pray for the church. Evil.